Think of assembly constraints as the 3D version of sketch constraints you've already used while designing parts. These are tools that help you create relationships in 3D between components, such as making two components flush with each other, making two cylindrical components concentric, or even tangent. There are lots of different ways to constrain assembly items, but they all essentially work to remove degrees of freedom from components as you add them. Eliminating degrees of freedom allows parts to be attached just like they would in real life. The most common way to add constraints is with the Constraint tool found in the Position panel. This brings up a window where you can define how parts will be constrained with each other. There are four tabs in the window, but we'll only be working with the Assembly tab for now since it contains the most frequently used tools. The four types of assembly constraints are Mate, Angle, Tangent, and Insert. In this lesson, I'll be going over the Mate constraint, which is a powerful and versatile constraint. When constraining parts, you can select points, edges, faces, axes, and planes. Each selection will have a different effect, and your selection will depend on your desired result. To get started, I'll constrain the hole in the wheel to the cylindrical hole in the bracket. When working with circular edges or cylinders, Inventor will allow me to select the cylindrical face which highlights the axis of rotation, or I can select the circular edge. In this case, I want the two axes to line up, so I'll be sure to click on the cylindrical faces. As soon as I make the second selection, the component snaps into place, and I can click Apply to add the constraint. The Place Constraints window remains active, which is nice because it usually takes more than one constraint to assemble components, but I'll close it for just a moment. If I click and drag the wheel, notice I can only move it along the cylindrical axis of both the wheel and the hole in the bracket because of the constraint we added. I've locked down some of the degrees of freedom, but not all. This is the basic approach to assemblies. Bring in a part that is completely free to move in space, then add constraints to restrict this movement. I'll once again click Constrain to eliminate more of the degrees of freedom. Next, I need to center the wheel between the two flanges of the bracket. There are a few ways to do this. Here's one approach. If I click on one of the faces of the wheel, and then the flat face of the bracket, you can see this mates the two faces together. And if I look straight on with the assembly, this is clear. But we want to center it, so notice the offset box here. If I were to measure the distance, I would know how much to offset it from the flat face. I can type in a positive or negative value here. But what would this do for our design intent? If the bracket were to ever get wider, then using this approach would always keep the wheel offset with whatever value I type in here. So let's look at another approach. When we designed these parts, we incorporated some symmetry, which left the default reference planes of each part running straight through the center of each. We can take advantage of those reference planes when we add the constraints. To do this, I must expand each item in the browser. When I expand the origin folder, I can hover my mouse over the planes to see a preview and select it when I see the plane that runs through the center. If I didn't have these default planes here, I could always create new planes to mate. As you become more experienced, you'll find that you'll be thinking ahead as you design parts to have the reference planes end up in places where they help you at the assembly level like we have here. As soon as I select the other plane, it snaps into place. Notice they highlight in colors that correspond to the color of the selection buttons. If I again look straight on with the assembly, you can see it's centered within the bracket. Because of the design intent we incorporated with this approach, if any components get wider in the future, they would still remain centered here. At this point, all I have to do is insert the pin. To do this, I'll select the cylindrical faces and the pin snaps into the hole. 
I'll press Apply. At this point, if I click and try to move the pin, it's free to move on the axis. So to finish constraining it, I'll press the Selection 1 button and click the end face of the pin. Next, I'll click on one of the flat faces of the bracket and it snaps into place. If the alignment is not what you were expecting, you can use the solution buttons to flip the alignment. I can either mate the faces together or make them flush. The pictures are helpful in determining which alignment to use. In either case, you can still apply an offset with a positive or negative value. Once it looks good, just click apply and close the constraint window. Before concluding this lesson, I want to point out that all of the constraints we added are listed here in the browser. If I hover over them, you can see they highlight in the design window. As you might expect, these constraints can be edited or deleted just like features you've seen up to this point. Just right-click, select Edit, and the same window appears.